Okay, so um, I'll just quick introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. Um, my name is George Chanel. Um, I'm the manager of the Wold Cellular Imaging Centre, which is based at King's College London. Um, so um, I'm going to give a talk today about some work that we've done with the airy beam um, light microscopes that we've got. Um, so these are some systems that are quite novel um, and some work that we've done with it is quite exciting to show you. So um, I hope you find it as exciting as I do. Um, quick outline of the talk. As I said, we're going to talk about these microscopes and what they are. Um, I try and spend a bit more time talking about what we've imaged them with and very briefly at the end, some future directions of where we're going with this technology. Um, so for those of you that aren't yet aware of what um, selective plane illumination microscopy is about, um, it's a relatively new um, mode of fluorescence microscopy where instead of using scanning optics, you use a, a sheet of light that's um, passed into the sample um, parallel to the focal plane of a detection lens. So uh, this has um, the ability to create 3D, 3D data by optical sectioning, similar to that that you'd get with a confocal. Um, but instead of passing a laser beam one pixel at a time, it's creating a sheet of fluorescence and all of that passes directly to a camera. So it's relatively speedy um, in terms of frames. Um, and the other large benefit you get is that you're not illuminating out of the focal plane like you would with a confocal. Um, so the benefit there is that you don't get out of focal uh, bleaching. Um, so the benefit, yeah, the, that, that gives you a really reduced um, photo bleaching or phototoxicity for live samples um, and can work as fast as your camera um, can give, um, can work as fast as the camera um, can read. So it combines speed and um, sensitivity all in one. Um, and there's multiple different ways of forming these sheets. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the unique features of the, the system that we have. Um, so our, um, our systems use a uh, airy beam um, setup. So the, um, sorry, I'm still admitting a few people. Um, the, um, what is an airy beam, you might ask? Well, let's just start with what is, yeah, how does not light normally form? It's usually formed into what's called a Gaussian uh, beam shape. So that's just characterized by the mathematical um, shape that you can record across it. But um, typically, um, yeah, in this diagram, we're being shown a comparison of Gaussian vessel and airy beams. So um, the difference here is that a Gaussian beam, you get a very short focal point um, compared to the others. Um, the, um, sorry, just collecting my thoughts whilst I'm um, still admitting a few people. Um, the uh, difference that you get between Gaussian and Bessel and airy beams is that um, Bessel and airy beams are what are called non diffracting beams. So they actually um, they're, they're able to propagate through space a lot further for the same um, uh, optics that you use. The benefit that you get with that primarily is um, a large field of view with the same uh, with the same sort of resolution optics. So um, with the sort of size that you get here, if you were to try and stretch a Gaussian beam across this size, it would be much thicker. Or equally, a Bessel beam it would be thicker. Um, I've still got some people struggling here. Sorry. Um, the um, yeah sorry uh, so with airy beam illumination um, what you get is for the light sort of similar resolution you get a much larger field of view um, uh, yeah um, so you can see in these diagrams here at the bottom yeah with the same field of view um, with a Gaussian beam you only got the small region here where it's in focus um, and in order to obtain the same field of view um, you'd have to compromise and you know, essentially stretch this out much larger. Um, 
So um, as I mentioned, airy beams um, are a non-diffractive beam type. Um, and another benefit of this is that, is that it reforms as it propagates uh, as a sort of self-healing self effect. Um, so if something were to block the illumination as it comes through because it's absorbed, um, to some extent with airy beams, it will actually reform on the other side of that. Um, and it seriously reduces the reduction of striping artifacts, which you normally see in spin. Um, and compared to the other types of beam types, you get a relatively large field of view um, for the same, you know, for the resolution that's possible. Uh, and it's also relatively simple to physically implement, um, which is not a small consideration. Um, while it's tricky to design, um, the implementation is just a simple optical element. Um, so that that's um, particularly beneficial um, because yeah, it's simple to maintain. Um, so on the system that we um, have, you can see a photo here, how the system is configured, that you have an excitation lens where the, the beam is fired out of, and um, a detection lens where we collect the light, the fluorescence light back through. Um, and we prefer our samples on our little mounts like this, um, so holding it still with a bit of agarose, um, and that sits on top of an automated um, four axis stage so we can position our sample X, Y, and Z, and then the scanning is performed by a special X, Z uh, stage. The, um, that's so that the focal plane um, and the sample moves through the focal plane of the detection objective um, without um, causing shift. So you know, it's a, it allows you to collect a stack because you have to think about everything being um, tilted at 45 degrees with this particular setup. Um, the first system I'm going to talk about, and it's where we've done most of the work with, um, has four different laser lines that you can excite with and matching fluorescent um, filters. Um, and as mentioned, we've got this um, yeah, two dipping lenses which come down to that. Um, and this is, you know, as I said, one lens is used for excitation and one for detection. Um, the outcome of this is that you get a very large field of view compared to what you can do with other types of um, light sheet and you get sub-micron resolution in both axes. Um, again, relatively unparalleled. Um, on the particular system that we've got there, we've also got an incubator set up, so it's potential to do um, some live imaging over time. <coughs> um, so it's just some details about the system, but particularly featuring on the fact that we've got the ability to generate a very large field of view. Um, so you can imagine the real uh, benefits for having that large field of view is tissue imaging and being able to take things and keep them in context um, to where they, you know, where they sit within the tissue. Um, one of the largest sort of benefits you've got from using light sheet microscopy is that you haven't got to cut something 40 times, image all of the, the uh, the slides in a sort of and and then try and reconstruct those slides back together. You can just kind of leave your tissue in one piece, scan the whole thing. Um, we've primarily done this with um, tissues that have been had uh, optical clearing performed on them, and so far the sort of best results that we've really had with are uh, with clarity and scale s and cubic. We've also tried switch as well. It's the, these are just different techniques that are available, um, and. I'm going to show you some data today uh, with some neurons in brain tissue, microglia, um, some stem cell organoids, um, zebrafish, and some live organotypic, organotypic slice cultures. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit more in-depth idea about um, how um, airy beam illumination kind of comes out. Um, the light beam actually curves in space, which is a very odd property, um, but it's due to how the beam is actually formed. Um, and the um, you can see in this image here, essentially just the fluorescence coming from a static beam where we, you know, we just turned off the scanning optics um, so that you can see it. Um, and you can see the primary beam coming across the center of the field of view here, and then the secondary uh, beamlets, you might call, them um, and this is a characteristic of the airy beam um, geometry itself 
Um, but it's also to some extent a problem that you have to deal with. So um, if we put a, a fluorescent bead in, in um, suspension and image it, um, you get this sort of result here. So what you're looking at here is a, 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 a stack that's been turned on its side and then flattened. So you're looking at the Z dimension going up the image and um, you know, a flattened view from the side. So the aberration that you observe occurs in the Z direction. Um, and you get you know, where your bead is, primary source of fluorescence, but then these sort of side lobes that come off. So it's what we call the airy pattern. Um, and the image that you're seeing here, you've got a raw bead, um, and then the result once it's had processing performed on it to deconvolve and get rid of these, these uh, airy pattern from it. Um, the image on the right here is just a different color scale to make it a little bit more visible to the eye, um, but it's essentially just the same result. Um, so um, yeah, you can see that we're able to actually deal with this artifact um, and we're able to get it back to um, you know, point source of fluorescence. So when you um, look at some real data, um, you've got an example here of uh, a, um, some GFP expressing uh, neurons that were supplied by Tony Vernon and Robert Chester. Um, and on the left, you've got the raw um, data as it came off the microscope. Um, this is a uh, cropped region from a full field of view. You might imagine this isn't 600 microns. Um, the uh, view that you've got here, again, is an X and Z projection so that you can see it from the sort of side on. Um, and you can see the effect of this airy pattern causing these little, um, what I like to call Z smudge, but it, it isn't really, it is actually patterned. Um, when you deconvolve this, it will then, um, get rid of that effect and you can see it faithfully re reconstructs the um, the biological information underneath. What does that look like um, when you look at it in 3D? So you can see here two cells. Um, I'm going to just sort of pay attention to this because um, I'm going to show you some analysis from this same data set later. Um, so you've got these two, two cells here and you can see all of the branching structure coming from it. Um, the, uh, this, as I mentioned, is a, is a crop um, of a full field of view that's possible. And I'm now gonna show you that um, in this next render. So um, the, um, what this really shows you is that you, know, you can obtain that kind of detail and resolution at a much, much grander scale. Um, and this really isn't within the limits of what we can do with these microscopes. Um, so this was two, uh, two stacks stitched together, um, so two um, nearly uh, nearly nine, 900 micron deep stacks um, stitched together to generate almost a cubic millimeter of um, data um, at the sort of scales uh, which you really couldn't do. And this takes about two or three minutes to scan those two full fields of view. Um, so, because we can run the uh, camera at you know, very, very short uh, frame rates, um, you know, this, this really didn't take very long to uh, obtain. Um, the, um, so, in, in how sort of protocols that we've really worked with um, a lot are being able to mount these samples effectively and get the clearing to be maintained. So, um, it's a sort of process that we're um, in the process of publishing actually. Um, but the um, yeah, imaging and clearing solutions with this type of setup is, um, you know, it took a bit of time to work out how to work that one through. And then the acquisition and stitching of the large tiled regions. So that's all been uh, worked through and effectively scripted now. Um, obviously it's more than just a, a, an image um, so what can you do with this? And I'm going to show you with these um, neurons, the detection of dendritic spines. Um, the tricky thing actually is if you take really, really large volumes of data like this is then being able to automatically detect things like this. Um, you can imagine things like Neurolucid, I don't really, um, anyone in here that's used them, I know one or two of you have, um, will probably be laughing right now thinking how how is that going to cope with such a large uh, volume of data? Um, but 
yeah, it's a, another thing that we're looking to work towards. Um, anyway, the images I'm about to show you are reconstruction of the um, somas and uh, axons and dendrites coming from the um, that cropped uh, volume I showed you there before. So that's you showing it overlaid on the data itself. And then the ability um, with the resolution that's possible, you can detect spines um, and see you know, those sorts of features um, at a very large scale. Um, other things that we have imaged with it, um, obviously neuroscience isn't just about neurons. Um, and I just want to sort of take that moment just to say, you know, we have been looking at some other um, types of uh, sample. Um, so some microglia that were um, provided again by Tony and Robert. Um, they, uh, with this, this also highlights another feature that's really useful for um, light sheet microscopy in particular. The, um, the morphology of these cells, you can see as it's rotating around, you've got these really fine branching um, dendrites that are coming off. And you can imagine if you section um, these or prepare them for that kind of uh, imaging, you might lose some of that information where you might see the cell body and a bit of the branching coming off. But what's really lost is, you know, you're not really seeing the full extent of where that cell goes. And it was a, a surprise, you know, when I showed this to Tony, he, he was really amazed at how, how far these projected out and, you know, the extent of their reach. Um, and I think it's worth keeping that in mind as well, is that, you know, you, you can take a, reg a brain region and then scan this and see what the cells are like um, and keep them in context. And it's, it's, that is really something that's worth underlining is the context. Um, the, uh, the other thing as well, I mean, sample preparation techniques, um, I know from what I've seen with, with what people have done, um, you know, sometimes when you mount for a slide, it might compress some of this into a sort of flattened, uh, a flattened version of what it is. Um, and that's, that's something that's worth you know, really considering is how is my sample preparation affecting what I'm actually looking at. Um, some other, um, another bit of data I want to show you, some, some organoids that we imaged. Um, so, you know, I'm sure most of you probably know better than I. Um, these are useful, um, particularly in the context of uh, differentiation, really useful model because you can um, in vitro re recreate the um, process of uh, neural tube formation um, where you get these little rosettes that form. So a rosette mimics this neural tube and you get a sort of stem niche in the center um, and differentiating um, neural cell types migrate out um, similar to how you get in the, you know, in the early developmental stages. Um, and so this was a sample that um, Deep in a Deepak's group um, helped me um, image. So he prepared them and, and cleared them. And um, he was interested to see um, over time with different samples how well these rosettes were forming. Um, and one thing he really didn't want to have to do was section a whole load of them and stain them. Um, rather than that, we can just leave them as they are, mount them in agarose, clear them, and, and image. And again, this is a cropped region, um, relatively deep compared to the surface, so it's not as good as it could be. Um, but I always like to show kind of the limits of what's possible. Um, and the green marker shows, you know, sort of the stem niche, as it were. Um, and you can see these, um, uh, although the antibody wasn't as clean as, as expected, the uh, neural progenitor cells uh, surrounding that. Um, and um, I also I'd just like to highlight the clearing technique. Um, so this is perhaps more of a moment to discuss different clearing techniques. Um, scale S, it's a um, aqueous based uh, clearing technique that will clear your sample in a matter of hours, which compared to clarity um, is you know, I think one or two orders of magnitude um, shorter um, and it's relatively cheap. Um, you probably have most of the components in your lab already, um, so it's relatively easy to use um, and, and really, really, really cheap. There's another point just to mention. Some of the clearing solutions can be very expensive. Um, something else that we've imaged um, 
zebrafish. So you can see here the the uh, the benefit of being able to tile and stitch together large, very large regions. So we imaged almost an entire tail. Um, hopefully, some of you recognise this from the uh, foyer <laughs> in the wall. Um, so in the magenta, you're seeing central nervous system, and um, in in the green channel, some grafted stem cells. Um, the uh, the the again the benefit here is that it was really quick to to image these these large regions um, and um, the level of detail that you can get you know you can really see um, some nice features from these these cells and um, if the magenta channel wasn't there you would also see some projections coming from some of these green cells um, so um, again, it's just to sort of highlight that light sheet microscopy really benefits that if you want to gather much larger volumes quickly, um, just to sort of go back and play this again, you know, these four fields of view that were stitched together, we obtained probably in about five to 10 minutes with two channels. Um, and, you know, it's three to 400 microns of, of data. So, you know, if you did that on a confocal or multi-photon, you're talking hours. Um, so yeah, again, really highlights the benefit of speed there. Um, so taking a moment just to break um, the um, that data is all from the um, first system that we had, um, and the um, the second that I'm going to talk about is the um, multi photon airy beam system. Although um, it's it's worth mentioning that you already get a very large benefit for depth penetration with the normal visible wavelengths that we use. Actually, this isn't the main reason why multi-photon illumination is used in this case. Um, multi-photon illumination with airy beam um, configuration actually really reduces the effect of the airy pattern um, and to, the, to, to an extent that you don't really need to do the post-processing to obtain the, um, the outcome. Uh, this is equipped with a tunable laser as most multi-photon systems are, um, so equivalent invisible to about 350 to 525. Uh, it uses a slightly different phase mask for the airy beam formation, which um, is actually something that we've just prepared for a preprint. Um, so a publication that's come out of this collaboration with M squared. Um, the resolution in terms of the focal, you know, within the focal plane of what you're looking at is the same as before, but there's a slight cost to the axial resolution to obtain no need to post-process the, uh, the, the data. Um, and some imaging that I did with um, Scott and Kay um, last year, which is going into that publications with some um, slice culture imaging. So we um, put some, uh, Organotypic slice cultures transfected with Venus, um, and Scott and Kay were interested to to see the outcome of this, and you know how how, how fast can we speed up the acquisition of large stacks? Um, so the um, yeah that that same data you're seeing there again, this is a cropped region from a larger field of view, but you're seeing this little cluster of cells um, and the um, 3D shape of the dendrites coming out around them. Um, the um, larger field of view that was, you know, this is effectively the raw um, stack, as it were, um, shows, you know, you can collect multiple cells in one go at what, and yeah, all of that data is then available to you relatively rapidly. Um, the and yeah, this data is certainly good enough to do branch and tracing on. And um, yeah, you can see also some 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 details of spines coming off these. Although jury's still out as to whether you can um, quite um, get that to work as easily. Um, the future work that we're we're based on on some of this, particularly with the rotated. So the second system that I just showed you is, is something we're going to work towards is stage-based scanning. So um, I mentioned at the start the four-axis stage. Um, instead of taking a sort of 45-degree um, stack as you normally would with, with this, because we're not having to post-process the data, we're, we're aiming now to use stage-based scanning um, so that you know, effectively we can just pass um, 
things like slice sculptures through um, and you know, much more um, automated uh, acquisition of that. Um, and also in development is also a uh, multi-position sample mount for uh, things like imaging a few fish at once over time. Um, and yeah, that's something I'm again collaborating with M squared for um, a 3D printed sample mount. Um, so uh, just concluding now, um, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that helped with this. It's quite a uh, nice set of collaborations with different people. Um, so Tony and Robert, particularly early on with the um, neurons and microglia. Um, Deep, um, particularly for the organoids, um, and um, Seb for the, um, the zebrafish. Um, we've done a few more attempts with that as well recently. Um, Keicho and Scott for the um, organotypic slice cultures and the team at M squared um, have been instrumental in you know, various developments as we've been going along. Um, so I'd like now to open up um, the possibility for some questions. Um, I've just unmuted you all, so I'm not quite sure how we're going to manage this in a situation because I can't see you when you put your hands up. <laughs> um, so has anyone got any questions? Anyone? Um, George. Hi. I'm Kay. Um, so the Where's my? Yeah. So the 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 there's a two lenses uh, side by side, and the one is the um, project. The other one is a detect the image. Um, is that angle is best optimized angle, or if angle is different, and then can we see the more depth, or what, what was the um, the? So, um, yeah, the the the, the angle. Um, perhaps if I. Um, hop back to that um, particular slide. Uh, yeah. but, but, but. Um, that essentially is formed um, because the, um, the 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 beam comes out. Um, you know, um, it comes out uh, orthogonal to the the direction of the that lens. And then where you want that to be is in the focal plane of your detection lens, mm. which is itself um, orthogonal, you know, it's, it's parallel to the, the base of that. So my question is, is at the moment it is set up like 45 degree, right? Yeah. So if it changes like um, different angle, then can you see more better resolution or doesn't really matter? Or that, no. that is it very much optimized as 45 is optimized angle? Yeah, that that is the the optimal angle. Um, uh, yeah, the, if, if you were to change it, you'd have a you know, one end, one side of your of your view not in focus. I see. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, open for more questions. Hi, um, Linda here. I Hi. Um, just a quick question about clearing. How, what does it do and how does it work? Um, so there's, there's different um, methods to it, um, but broadly um, the idea is that you either remove the um, uh, sort of lipid based content from your sample or um, you replace all of the um, aqueous solution with something that's more lipid based. Um, so the um, yeah the, um, the the idea is that you're so when you know, in, in in a in when within a cell you know when when you go between a bit of water and a lipid membrane that causes a bit of diffraction of light. Um, so with clearing, essentially you're kind of trying to remove those. Uh, Interfaces, as it were, um, to try and make it very transparent. 
Um, now, the different techniques such as you know, clarity will use uh, a sort of electrophoresis um, means where it sort of pushes um, uh, pushes different compounds into the sample so that they um, uh, it, it replaces all of the um, the solution so that it's effectively more lipid based. Um, um, so uh, the yeah, essentially that's how it works. Um, the, the, as I said, there isn't one technique to it, so they, they'll work. They bro broadly fall into two classes of being either aqueous or lipid based solutions um thank you okay thanks um anyone else got any uh questions that they want to ask okay um well the the other thing other sort of section i wanted just to Hi, sorry. Hi, Robert. Uh, it's Robert here. I have a question. Um, you talked about um, that you have to do some post-processing of the raw data. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How long does that take, and what does it involve? Okay. Um, the um, yeah. So the the way that that works is um, uh, the the data is um, first um, geometrically. Um, shifted so the um okay i'm just going to go back to the um thing here so that i can show a bit more clearly um yeah this curve of that beam actually means that you're in the center you would be illuminating a very slightly different part of the sample at uh, the edges um so when you gather a full stack you know it's effectively a very slightly curved um, and the the post processing deals with that. Um, it then subsequently um, uh, looks for this pattern in all the data um, and extracts it back to the uh, point source. Um, it's a process called deconvolution. Um, so I don't know if you've um, ever done that before with any data, but um, yeah. Uh, in terms of how long does that take? Um, Back when we first started this about three years ago, it was incredibly slow because the software was in its infancy. Um, they have subsequently now uh, made this um, graphics card accelerated, and you know the the um, you can take. Um, I think I think the last time we did this, what would have taken three weeks takes three hours now to, to process so yeah we have this installed on um, one of our workstations at the facility and um, it's fairly straightforward um, it just takes a bit of processing time um, but um, yeah certainly something like um, the sort of very large field of view that you saw stitched together with the neurons that would take 10-20 minutes to process now okay so, thank you very much okay. yeah that's good Thanks. Um, okay. Um, does okay. If if there's any more questions or. Um, well, the, the other thing I was going to just use this um, time just to talk about briefly, obviously, is a couple of updates. Um, so, the um, with the facility, um, I have to skip through all of this. Um, so, as you can probably imagine, the uh, facility is temporarily closed um, due to the current viral um, quarantine regulations. Um, we are still open if you are doing any uh, projects which actually you're working towards um, combating the, uh, the virus itself. Um, you do still have access to the analysis workstations. So I set up remote access um, by a team viewer and the, the existing facility users will have been sent the information. 
Um, we've planned later in the year some drop-in sessions for the new storm microscope, the multi-photon, um, and the, these Aries firm systems that I've just shown you. Um, and although these were planned for late April, obviously now we're looking to postpone these later in the year. Um, so um, please, um, you know, keep 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 your uh, eyes open for any announcements on on when those will be rescheduled. To um, I can't plan anything until we know when um, we're all back to to work as normal. So. Um, uh, I'd like to th thank you all for your um, attention today. Um, we've recorded this session, so we'll be able to share it um, soon, hopefully. Um, and um, yeah, thanks, thanks for all for listening. Thank you, George. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thank you.